you have to have that in order to hook the engine up. Now, where, you, where you've got the Stevenson valve here, you have two eccentrics. They're hooked into a link. That little thing here that John had here a while ago, and he took it, that had the Stevenson valve here in it. And that was a locomotive valve here. And this fellow, Stevenson, that invented that valve here, he invented it so that he could reverse the engine. That's all he invented for. But after he got it made and he got to fooling with it, he found out he could hook that thing up and economize on steam, and that's what they ended up doing with doing that. And you've got to, especially on locomotives, not so much on traction engines, but a locomotive, you just keep linking that thing up, well, that engine won't barely run. And that's one reason, one of the reasons on locomotives, you don't have any governor on that thing. The governor on that engine is that engineer sitting right there with his hand on the Johnson bar. And he can control that engine with the cutoff. And uh, whereas a, a traction engine, you probably got two or three notches or something like that because you just, uh, and then you have what they call a, a throttling type governor on the traction engines. And all that throttling type governor amounted to was a pressure reducing valve, depending on how much load you had on that engine. If you didn't have any load on it, maybe the pressure in that steam chest wouldn't be 10, 15 pounds. And that, all that governor did was raise and lower the pressure depending on the load to maintain the speed. Whereas the modern stationary engines, not traction engines, but modern stationary, what they had, had what they called an overriding valve. And it set up on top of the valve. And it, you had another eccentric on the crankshaft. And it controlled the cutoff of that engine. And that's what controlled the speed. It didn't have a throttling governor. It had an overriding valve governor. And they called it automatic. And it maintained the speed by the cutoff. And they are very good. It's a lot more efficient than the old throttling engine on the, on the traction engines. But uh, sad as it may seem, you just couldn't hardly adapt that uh, automatic governor to the traction engine because on these automatic governors, that engine sat there and run at one speed all the time. And they were real fine where the old traction engines you had to jock him up and down the road and everything and it just wouldn't be practical at all to use that type of a gun. Now let me uh, uh, briefly uh, discuss the, the Stevenson valve gear which is a very popular valve gear with the old steam traction engines. A lot of companies put that on their uh, uh, engines and it had its bad points. But it wasn't, if you kept it up in shape, it wasn't too bad of a valve gear. There was too many of them got out in the field. Too many companies used them for them to be that bad. Ivan, yes. excuse me just a minute. I think if he goes ahead, you can come to a link valve gear. Why don't you run ahead? I'll run it through there and I'll show it to you. Than with the cross rods. But uh, the 
I think the old camp monitor that uh, Lyman Knapp has has open rods. Isn't that right, Chaddy? But most of the traction engines and Nichols and Shepard and the guards got uh, had the cross rods. Uh, they, uh, I don't know now, on the cross rods, with the Stevenson valve gear, I call linking it up. And what I mean by linking it up, I'm, I mean by that is bringing it up to what they call mid gear. And that's when you got that quadrant in the middle, I mean, that your reverse lever in the middle of the quadrant. And when you got her down in the corner, you either got her down full gear forward or full gear reverse. And with cross rods, as you, make, as you start linking it up, bringing it back to the middle, you start decreasing your lead. Whereas on rope and rods, as you start linking it up and bringing it to the center, you start increasing the lead. And that was advantage, the reason they used that thing and them locomotives on the open rods. Uh, but if, if, if you fellas have got uh, link motion engines, which if you've got a Nichols and Shepard to the old side mount, whether it's a double or a single, you've got Stevenson valve gear. But the same token, the Gar Scott, they used the Stevenson valve gear and the doubles and their singles. And the same with the Rumley. On, on the single Rumley engines, they, they used the Arnold reverse. And on the double Rumleys, they used the Stevenson valve gear. So the Stevenson valve gear, I've heard a lot of people cuss it. And, uh, I've been guilty of it myself, but it could stand with the best. It wasn't, it wasn't too bad. There's too many people who used it. Uh, the uh, one thing about it, you had you had just twice as many parts you have to look after. But if you kept it up in shape, it worked for you. But one thing I never could understand about, I've got four nickel Shepherd engines, but I never could understand why they built them engines that way. Don't get me wrong, Henry, I'm not talking about the engine. Uh, on double side mounts, they had you'd have four assemblies. For each cylinder, you just got two cylinders, you got two ascendants per cylinder. And on the double side mounts, they made that eccentric together. Both eccentrics are molded in one piece. And they keyed that thing on the crankshaft, on both sides. But on their singles, they sat through it on. Now, if they're smart enough to put that on their doubles, they're smart enough to put it on their singles, but they never did. I suppose so you could move it around and fudge on it a little bit. Uh, but one thing about the, the ones that was uh, set screwed on the crankshaft, especially if you got a dry valve and was cheating on the lubrication or something, that valve, especially a D valve, went to pulling pretty hard. And you pull them set screws loose. You go to work in that old engine, as I say, when you had her pulled plumb down on her knees and you had that throttling governor had all the pressure that old boiler was carrying in on that valve, you had a tremendous amount of pressure on that valve. And that was, uh, uh, you know, it, it had been knowing they just tear them old engines up, especially if you got a dry valve, it just tear that length plumb off of there. And a lot of them did happen that way. And you, and you know, in modern day and hobby people there, if you get a dry valve, that old reverse lever will start rocking on you. That's one thing if you're fooling with it, you know, if you're maybe thrashing her on the fan or on the pony brake or something. You want to watch that uh, thing, and if that valve gets to jerking on you, it's possible you've got a dry valve. And you could do some damage uh, with, with uh, you know, your lubricator might have quit working or your check could have quit working. Uh, there's numerous things there that will get you out of lubrication. And poor lubricating oil, too, will do the same thing. And we've had our, our share of poor lubricating oil, and this oil we're getting now from Continental Refinery is seems to be doing a pretty good job. But one thing that you fellas have got has Stevenson valve gear engines. You, most of the time, you don't have to go through this procedure that they give you in these books here unless you completely tear that engine down. If you just tear it down, throw it all out in the ground, then you've got to. But for accidents that happen where it's uh, eccentric comes loose or something, uh, then it's not that complicated. But the thing you've got to remember about the Stevenson valve here, where you've got two independent uh, centers, is you've got to have them valve rods exactly the same length. They may be sitting in their whopper yard, but they've got to be pretty close to the same length. And that block, you've got a slide block that comes up and down in this right here. Right there's a the block. 
It's got to be with that engine on crank center. That's what the crank feathers to weigh. This block in the, and your quadrant in mid-gear, up here in mid-gear, this has got to be exactly in the center. Otherwise, when you move it from one motion to the other, and this is not in the center, it's going to move that valve. And the eccentrics, you can tell by looking at them, and most uh, manufacturers, when they put that engine on there, they chiseled them the eccentrics on the crankshaft. They had a mark that's under description to where if it slipped, well, you'd put it back where the mark was at. But now, some of them was guilty, maybe, of somebody putting a crankshaft in them or something there. Maybe you had to put a new eccentric on. Who knows? They wasn't marked. And then, uh, a quick reference there, you run that engine out on crank center. Get your tram. The first thing you got to do is make a tram so you get centers on them. Now, if the engine, uh, 99 times out of 100 in the traction engine nowadays, they ain't got any tram, you're going to make one. And put that engine on, on, it'll work for crank center or head center. It's a procedure's the same. It doesn't make any difference. And put that thing, or even you can put it on there, but ah, you get pretty close, but your eye, two of them. And them lengths, I mean, them eccentrics, that C part right here, with that on crank dead center, it's got to be pointing towards this length. Just like this end here, it's pointing towards the length. And you look at the position of them eccentrics, and they're probably 120 degrees ahead. One of them's 120 degrees behind. That's just looking at them behind. And if something has happened or they slipped, one of them's going to be out. That's just all there is to it. Or you can, you know, uh, it's very seldom in the hobby days here that uh, you tear these old engines up like they did in the days when they were using them because uh, back in the days when they were using them things, where they, they, run them, they run them more in a week than you run this thing in 10 years. So it, uh, it, once you get the valve set on a Stevenson geared engine or any engine as far as that goes, why, unless you have a catastrophe, why, you should never have any trouble anymore. But you need to know why that thing is made that way. And I won't go into the, to the discussion of how you set the valve gears on these things. Uh, probably the, even though it's case, uh, I'm not testing the case engine because uh, let's give the devil his dues. Old J.I. made a good engine. I mean, it's hard. You get that thing out there, it's hard to beat. And I've never heard of an engine uh, that would, uh, a big engine or the same that, that would uh, outpull a case engine. I just, they'll get come close, but I just don't believe they'll outpull them. And that, the reason for that is they have more displacement. And that trick in a case traction or in any traction engine, as far as that goes, is your piston displacement. It's how much you got. The same way an automobile is, is what displacement you got. That's, that's the clue to the whole thing. But this book right here, just forget about the case up there. Mark that out. But in this book, if you can follow the instructions, this not only pertains to case engines, it pertains to the whole blooming bunch of them. And you can use the rules they put in this book for most all attraction engines except the valve gear. Now the valve gear is different. Uh, the case had the, the wolf valve gear, which is a radial gear. And, but it, it's got the settings in there for it. But outside of that, the maintenance of the boiler, the maintenance of your gearing and your differential and your governor pertains to all of them. This is very good book. Only cost you about five bucks. Uh, like I told you a while ago, this uh, this this engine, this valve gear here, was used on your uh, on your. Uh, Nichols and Shepard, and your Gar engines, and your Rumley engines, but the late Nichols and Shepard are the double rear mounts that they come out with before, oh, they come out with them 1917, 1918, somewhere along in there. They didn't have that Stevenson valve gear on them. They had a radio valve gear, and it was called the Butterfield, and it was a takeoff of the Baker valve gear. If you look at this the valve gear that was on these late Nichols and Shepard, or I say double rear mounts. And run over there and look at the picture of the vapor valve here. They're very similar. I mean, it's just, it's just taken from the vapor. It's, you, 
you would be infringing on his patent. But he got enough off of it there to work. But it, 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 it is a takeoff of the Baker valve gear, the Butterfield, and it is a very, very good valve gear. It, uh, now on there, on, on this uh, uh, late model Nichols and Shepard, they, uh, they didn't have the eccentric key on the crankshaft, but it was pretty close to it. They had it set up there over the keyway, and they had a set screw on each side of the keyway. And then down in the middle,